to in the next homework. What I want to do now is, rather than going through those solutions, which I think are most efficient for you to do in a homework context, I want to talk about the electrokinetic coupling matrix and move from predictions of velocity and flow field to predictions of current. So that's the plan. Well, this is our electrokinetic coupling matrix. Again, this is a linear matrix that describes small deviations from thermodynamic equilibrium. And in particular, it allows us to take fields, a pressure field and a potential field, <coughs> or pressure gradient and an electric field, and then relate that back to fluxes, in this case, a flux of volume, or if you want to multiply it times density of mass, and in this case, a flux of current. We have come up with solutions for some of these. For chi 1, 1, for a circular tube, we can describe this as, well, for a circular tube, it's the radius squared over 8 eta, for eight, over 8 eta. For something that is close to a circle, we can approximate it with a hydraulic radius. For chi 1, 2, we've shown that that is given by epsilon phi naught over eta. And so this is a description of the velocities we expect to get in an area average sense as a function of pressure forcing and electrical forcing. Now what we want to do is we want to add on a description of what current we get out of a system when we force it with pressure, when we force it with an electric field. So if I take a system that looks like this and I apply a pressure gradient to it, what sort of current do you expect we'll generate? Yeah. So your pressure gradient will cause the positive charges in the fluid to move, so get a current in the opposite direction. Very good. Yeah, so if I uh, define a pressure gradient that's pointed in this direction, it's going to generate a flow. There'll be a parabolic distribution of velocity. The velocity at the wall will be small but finite. And if there's a net charge density at that wall, those ions will be moved by this flow. I have a bunch of ions in the bulk as well, right? I have some positive ions, and I have some negative ions in the bulk. Those will move with the flow as well. Do they create a current? I have a lot of heads shaking no. We're not going to get any current from the motion of the bulk, basically because the current corresponds to a net motion of charge. If I have positive ions moving to the right and negative ions moving to the right, that doesn't create any net current. But in those places where I do have a net charge density, then the motion of this fluid will cause a current. And so I can write an expression for the flow-induced current in this system.
that is given by this expression. This basically just says that if I have a net charge density anywhere in this flow, I take the integral of the product of that charge density with the velocity, and that gives me the whole current. Or that gives me the flow-induced current in this system. And this expression is independent of what is causing this velocity. This velocity is the velocity of the fluid. And that velocity can be caused by pressure or it can be caused by an electric field. If we take the specific case of flow generated by a pressure gradient in a thin double layer limit, then we can get a relatively straightforward description of what this current is. So if I apply a pressure gradient, I get a velocity distribution that looks like this. The solution for that velocity distribution, if I define my axes like this, and I call this y equals d, See, if y is equal to d, then I get 0. If y is equal to 0, then I get... Okay. This is my velocity distribution. At the same time, I can calculate what my charge density is. If I assume that I have a wall with a specific interfacial potential. And let's do this in the linearized case just to keep the math simple. <clears throat> now I'm going to write this rather than in terms of y. In the past, we did the semi-infinite solution by assuming that y was 0 at the wall. That's no longer the case because I've moved my y location to describe this using this expression. Now I need to write my potential as a function of distance from the wall. Oops. And so as I've written it here, I just wrote the difference between d, which is the distance that the wall is, from this center line minus the absolute value of y. And I can drop this absolute value as long as I focus just on the top wall. This distribution of the potential then immediately leads us to a description of the concentrations of the positive and minus charges in this system. And that directly leads us to a description of the net charge density in this system. And what we'll see is that this net charge density in the linearized case is just an exponential decay away from the wall. With a characteristic decay length of lambda d. Now, in the thin electrical double layer limit, this rho e basically only exists very close to the wall. And so I can zoom in on this region right at the wall. And if I do that,
Here's my little zoomed in area. I have a distribution of charge density. that goes like this, an exponential decay from some finite value at the wall down to zero. What does my velocity distribution look like when I zoom in to a length scale that's comparable to lambda d? I said that my velocity distribution is parabolic, but if I zoom in and I look close to the wall, what do I see? Yeah, if lambda d is really small and I zoom in, I'm basically going to see something that looks linear. So this distribution starts out, I mean, technically speaking, this distribution is a parabola, right? But if I zoom in, it basically looks linear. It goes way out here, and, and the parabolic nature of it I could see better if I went way away. But here I basically have a linear distribution. So I have an exponential distribution of the charge density multiplied by a linear variation in the flow field. And that is something that's straightforward to integrate, that I can integrate analytically. When I do this, I get that the charge density I get normalized by the surface area is given by this expression. And what that tells me is that my chi 2 1 from this analysis is in fact exactly the same as my chi 1 2.